Associate Professor Simon Mitchell, hello and welcome to ANSCA ASM for 2016. Thank you. Yeah, nice to be here. We've got a couple of things to talk about. Uh, first of all, you're presenting on Wednesday the plenary lecture. Can you, can you tell us about that presentation? Sure. So the, the presentation on Wednesday is about the work that we've been doing around the implementation of the surgical safety checklist. Uh, the, the checklist is something that most anaesthetists would be familiar with. It, it was a strategy that fell out of a project by the WHO, was run in the 2000s, looking at ways of trying to reduce complications and mortality around operations. And it, it, it was a, a strategy involved bringing a, a checklist into the operating room that was administered at three points, as most anaesthetists will be familiar with. One point called sign in when the patient first comes to the room, time out when the surgeon's about to start and the sign out which is uh, at the end of the operation and in each of those settings there's a series of points that are read out and checked. One of the key things about the checklist is it encourages communication between the members of the, the, the three teams in the operating room, the surgeons, the nurses, the anaesthetists and that the, the, the effect that using that checklist has has been evaluated very carefully now in at least five or six very comprehensive studies and it's very clear that if you use the checklist and use it properly it reduces mortality and complications in the perioperative period. So the focus now is on how to make people use it properly because clearly it's not rocket science if you have a checklist but you don't actually use it or you don't use all of it or only bits you, it, it will not have the same effect as it will if you use it properly. How will you get people to start using that checklist? Well, that's a really good question because we've struggled with that. It, it's, it's actually quite confronting for medical professionals to acknowledge that they even need to use a checklist. The way we're brought up in medicine is that if you are a competent person and you know your stuff really well and you're diligent then everything will kind of fall into place and patient outcomes will be good but it's not like that. I mean, the truth of it is we're all human and we all make errors. So the checklist is all about trying to prevent us make, making errors. And to get people to understand that is important. But getting back to the specifics of your question, we have designed a system that we think removes a number of the barriers that we were seeing as um, preventing optimal use of the checklist. So what we've done is we have, instead of the checklist always being led by a nurse, with a piece of paper with the checklist items on it. We have put the three phases of the checklist on big posters on the operating theatre walls where everyone can see them and read them. And then the responsibility for leading the checklist falls to the anaesthetist at the sign-in, the surgeon at the time-out, and the nurse at the sign-out. So the shared leadership, which we think encourages a sense that we're all one team and we're all part of this process. It's not nursing trying to lead it all the time. And we introduced that system into Auckland City Hospital uh, over a three or four month period beginning in late 2014 and ending in 2015 and audited compliance and engagement in the checklist before and after we introduced it. And what we've demonstrated is a substantial improvement in the use of the checklist, the completeness with which it is used when it is used and the engagement of all the teams in using it so what we want is when the checklist is being administered we want everyone to be engaged and listening and participating not doing something else at the same time and we have recorded and published substantial improvements in all of those things as part of this new system so a wall mounted paperless checklist with migrated leadership appears to work very well. We published that in BMJ Quality and Safety in December last year, so just four months ago. And now the Health Quality and Safety Commission in New Zealand is funding a project to travel around all the DHBs in New Zealand and promote this new system with the expectation that they will adopt it. So we're hopeful that it's going to make a real impact in the uptake and use of this strategy that has been demonstrated to save lives and reduce complications. So that's on Wednesday for those who are watching and listening at the moment. That's the, uh, the lecture, the uh, plenary lecture. But uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, you've also got another presentation um, about one of your big passions, deep sea diving and the effects on the body. Yes, well, we, we, I've been a diver all my life and um, 
it's interesting actually that there's quite a few parallels between diving and anesthesia. So we absorb gases, we eliminate gases. Patients absorb gases, eliminate gases. We use circle circuits or rebreathers for very deep diving because they're very conservative of gas. We use circle circuits and anesthesia every day and there are, there are, there are a number of these nice little tie-ins. And so my talk on Tuesday is to exemplify some of those by interweaving them into a story of a very deep dive that we did in 2002 to solve arguably one of Australia's most vexing maritime mysteries, which is the location of Australian hospital ship Centaur, uh, which sank in 1943 with a huge loss of life. Uh, 263 Australian servicemen and women died on that wreck when it was torpedoed. And most, most of them were medical, so there's that medical tie-in as well. We dived the wreck thought to be the Centaur in 2002 and found that it was the wrong wreck. And that sparked an initiative by the government to try and find the right one. And they did. They commissioned the ship that found the Bismarck in the Atlantic and, the, and HMAS Sydney off, off Western Australia to go and search for the Centaur and they found it. So it's had a nice ending, that story. And I'm going to talk about that but interweave some of these commonalities between anaesthesia and diving into the talk. It's, so it's a slightly, I wouldn't say light-hearted, but uh, one of those sort of different talks that you often get at these conferences. Well, for a lot of the Australians as well, that was a big story. 60 Minutes covered the uh, discovery of the Centaur back in 1993. And then to have you come along and say, no, I'm sorry, the wrong boat. What was the reaction when you, when you discovered that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we... Uh, we, when we first did the dive, we, we very quickly, during the dive, we formed the view that it wasn't the Centaur, but, because the ship was just too small, but we didn't find anything on the wreck that actually said, this is what I am. I mean, we didn't find a ship's bell or lettering on the side of it. We just, we just had this small ship, too small to be the Centaur. But because we had no proof, we, we'd initially decided not to say anything, because we would be disenfranchising a whole lot of people who thought they knew where their loved ones were, were laying wreaths, they were like going out there and throwing wreaths over the side. I think there was a memorial on the nearest point of land and all this kind of stuff. And um, we were going to say nothing, but then news of the dive leaked out, and it actually evoked a lot of mixed reactions. Now, some people thought it was fine, but there was a there was a, a, a substantial proportion of people in the public who thought we'd done the wrong thing, by diving this you know sacred site and disturbing it, which we didn't. But nevertheless, there was that perception, and. 60 Minutes were actually interested in that aspect of the story. You know, is it okay to dive a, 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 a grave site, a war grave? And then we told them, we were, we were kind of forced to say, well look, we did this dive because we don't think it's the right wreck, and it's not the right wreck. And all of a sudden that overtook everything, that angle, because it was such a big story. And so they made a program about our dive and did some investigation into the circumstances under which that wreck that we dived had been discovered, found that the guy who had discovered it with an underwater robot had had convictions for fraud and there was a lot of intrigue around that aspect of the story and all of this, that milieu prompted the Australian government to send two Navy ships up to check, to use their sonar, it was too deep for them to dive but they used their sonar to measure the ship and found that we were right. It was way too small. And after that, they funded the search for the real Centaur, which they found several years later. So it's had a nice ending. For a while there, it was slightly unsatisfying because we, we'd revealed that it was the wrong ship, but we hadn't provided any closure. In fact, we'd undone their closure for the, for the relatives and families. But now they have it. And actually, they're going to the right place. So that's cool. Well, like that's that. quite, it's quite a story, and uh, so that's tomorrow you're presenting on that. What time is that? Uh, I think that's at 10.30. I, I must have to check the time out. table. I'm, I, um, yeah, I have to check my timetable, that's right. Okay, and of course you're presenting on Wednesday at the plenary lecture. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us, and enjoy the ANSCA ASM. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you.